Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. <clears throat> We're here to talk about auto body today. My colleague, Mark Stoddard, I know some of you have met him and talked to him. He wasn't able to make it today, so he's left some material over there if you're interested in it. Uh, so we're going to be talking primarily today about Indiana's automobile refinishing rule. It's 326 IAC 8-10. You have it in front of you. Uh, we call it 810. Before we get into the actual discussion, let's kind of go through your handouts. This document looks like this. That's the rule, 10-pager. We're going to be going through that in detail here in just a moment. This one here is called Frequently Asked Questions. You know, like I told you before, I've been doing body shop inspections for 12 years, and I've had a lot of questions over those 12 years, and I've kind of put some of them, ones that I get most often in here. So if you want to look at that on your own time, you can. This one here is called a fact sheet. And what it's for is just a very general overview, just announce that the rule has changed and that uh, you might want to keep your eyes on it, basically. And then this one is a comparison of the federal rule and the state rule. We're going to start talking with this one, so please grab this one, the comparison. <clears throat> We're going to start with it. Okay, Indiana first issued an automobile refinishing rule in 1994. So our rule predates the EPA's rule by, by at least 10 years. So our rule's been around a while. At first it was only four counties, two down south and two up by Chicago. And then recently, in the late 2009, it was expanded to every county in the state. Uh, so it's, it's been around a while. This document talks about the requirements from each rule. And what I try to do is take that big, long NESHAP, the federal rule, and distill it down to the basic requirements. And that is in this far column. Indiana's requirements are in the, it's in the middle of the column. So uh, for 6H, you know, it's based on, it, it's a very broad, wide rule. They talk about the five metals in the paints. If you have those metals in your paint, then you're required to comply with 6-H. And it, they require a spray booth. It also requires filters. It requires training every five years and so forth. So it has, it's a very broad rule. It's sort of like a shotgun. If you fire a shotgun, the pellets go out. And that's the way 6-H is. 810, the Indiana state rule, is more like a rifle. It's is focused in on one pollutant, volatile organic compound, VOCs. That's all. It's very narrow in its focus, just VOCs. So that's the basic difference between the two. Uh, <clears throat> so if, when you have time, if you want to go through this, this will very quickly tell you the requirements in both of the rules. Of course, if you want more details, you have to go to the rules. But that's a very quick reference for it. Now, if you would please pick up your state rule. It looks like this. Okay. It's uh, the, the heart of the matter. All right, if you look at the first thing right here, about just about middle of the page here, <clears throat> the rule applies to any body shop in the state of Indiana. But there are three activities that are exempt from the rule. One is using aerosol coating products. If you use aerosol, that's exempt from the rule, that activity. Also, graphic design. If you're involved in graphic design, that activity is exempt from the rule. And finally, touch-up coating. If you're doing any touch-up coating, that's exempt from the rule. So it's just surface coating of automobiles, refinishing of automobiles. And then right below that, the rule itself, the entire rule, does not apply if you paint three or fewer cars. So if you're like a guy who does it on the side in his garage or something, the rule doesn't apply if you paint three or fewer cars. Next, you see there's definitions. And there are several pages of definitions, and I'm not going to go through each one of those with you. I'll let you read that on your own time, but you might want to be familiar with some of those terms, the way that the rule defines them may be different than the way you think they're defined. So for the rules purposes, you might want to look through those sometime when you have a chance. All right, please turn to page 76 of the rule. There in the middle of the page, 8-10-4. Page 76, this is the meat and potatoes of the rule. This is the limits for volatile organic compounds. If you look under the rule, on the left side of the page are a group of categories, different types of painting, coating. Those categories, 
the number that corresponds on the other side of the page are the VLC limits. So if you have a pre-coat, then your limit is 5.5 pounds per gallon of VOCs. If you have a specialty coat, your limit is 7.0 pounds. So this is the heart of the matter. Whatever paint you get in, whichever category it falls into here on the left, the corresponding limit is on the right. And when I come in to do an inspection, or any other inspector, we're going to spend the bulk of our time during the inspection focusing on this. We're going to be looking at records of the jobs that you've done, and we're going to look to make sure that you're under these limits. Okay? And later on in the rule, there's some record keeping requirements that will provide the inspector with enough information to determine if you're under those limits. So these categories are all defined in the definition, so if you want to look for that, you can. You can. Okay, page 77, the next page. See there at the top where it says work practice standards? All right, first thing that it says there in section 5A, you must use an enclosed gun cleaner. Indiana law, the rule, requires an enclosed gun cleaning device. Uh, a lot of system, a lot of places have gun cleaners that have a reservoir underneath where it can evaporate through the top. There's no lid. Those are not allowed anymore. Must have something that is enclosed so that it won't evaporate into the air. Because that's what we're trying to do with this rule is stop those evaporative emissions of VOCs. Okay, now that it must have the lid, and of course you must use the lid. You can't leave it up all the time. You've got to close it when you're done. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of times, what happens in a shop is. Painter will have the gun, he'll go over and he'll start cleaning, then he'll get a phone call, and he'll leave it there and he'll turn around and walk away. And while he's on the phone talking, I come around this corner and there's a gun cleaner wide open and it's evaporating into the air. Now when I come in and see that, that's going to be a violation of, of this rule. And I'm going to write you up for it. So make sure that you keep that thing closed when you're not actively using it. I mean, if you have to be there actively using it. If you're not there actively using it, make sure you shut it. Okay? Keep that lid down. Okay. Now, it also mentions there a little later on, manufacturer's recommendations. What that is, is when you buy the gun cleaner, there comes a set of guidelines or instructions or recommendations from the manufacturer to how to care for the gun, how to keep the gun running, and how to operate it, and so forth. So you need to have those on site for when the inspector comes, because if we see something that we're not quite sure about, we may ask to see those recommendations, read through those, and make sure you're keeping that gun cleaner as it should be. Because a lot of people, you know, they bang the door, maybe they crack it, and it doesn't work as well. So that door has to be able to close and keep the emissions in. Okay? Yeah, and if you don't have the instructions, call the company and have them send them to you. Because you need to have those on site. Yes, that's true. That's, that's my next point. Good point. They can, you can download most of those. I think I had one guy told me you can't, and the one he had, but most of them you can. Okay, if you look down next in uh, section B, kind of the middle of the page there, you must use either an elect electrostatic equipment for your painting, which I haven't encountered anybody that has that, or HVLP, which is what almost everyone that I've been to has. Now, a lot of people have HVLP equivalent equipment, and that's fine as long as you meet number three there. 65% transfer efficiency. Whatever gun you're using, it must be able to achieve 65% transfer efficiency or it is not sufficient for the rule. Okay, so 65%, if it wants to be an HVLP equivalent, it must achieve 65% efficiency in transferring the paint. If it doesn't, then it's not sufficient and we're gonna write you up for it. So make sure that your guns are sufficient. Now. It also requires right below that that you keep the recommendations for how to operate the guns, how to clean the guns, that sort of thing. You have to keep those there on site also, just like the gun cleaner. So those instructions need to be on site somewhere. If you can't, if you don't have them, make sure you call the company or download them from the internet. Okay, now if you have an HVLP equivalent that achieves 65% transfer efficiency, you need to have documentation on site that it does achieve the 65 percent. If you don't, call your manufacturer and get that because if I come in and see that it's an HVLP equivalent, I'm going to ask you to see those to make sure that they really do achieve 65 percent transfer. Okay. okay. If you go down to C, middle of the page, 
all of you, we're going to talk about housekeeping here. All of your paper, cloth, plastic, whatever material you use in your, in your operations. Anything that comes in contact with paint or solvent or anything that releases VOCs in the atmosphere, you need to dispose of it in a closed container. So whatever has paint on it or solvent on it or anything that releases VOCs into the air needs to be disposed of in a, in a lidded container, a closed container. So that way you can open it up, put the, put the trash in there, and then close it. Okay, and you need to keep it that way until you dispose of it off-site. So a lot of people, what they do, what they end up doing down in Clark County County is a lot of people have a, a trash can with a lid, and they have a liner inside of it. And they throw that in there, and then when it gets full, they just tie that liner up real tight and take that out to the dumpster, and that's fine if you do that. Okay. All right, these closed containers, whether it's a trash can or whatever, is going to have a closed container. Of course, you have to keep it closed. You have to make sure there's no leaks, make sure there's no holes, no cracks, you know, because sometimes those lids get knocked off, they fall on the concrete, and they crack. That won't work. It has to have a lid that's functional in good operating condition. Okay? And the can itself can't have cracks, can't have holes. It's got to be able to hold everything in. Okay, if you look at it next, it says store in closed containers any solvent, any coatings, basically anything that has VOCs in it. Make sure you keep the container closed. Don't leave a can of paint on the mixing bench open. Okay, because if, once again, if I come around the corner and I walk into the mix room and there's a can of paint or a can of solvent sitting there open, I'm going to write you up for violating the rule. Now, if you look at the very last line there, no cleaning shall be performed by direct spraying of solvents into the atmosphere. Back in the old days, you used to be able to disassemble your gun and clean it and put it back together and spray into the air and make sure that it's working right. Can't do that anymore. Not allowed to directly spray into the atmosphere. Okay. That kind of makes sense when, you know, if you have to use a gun cleaner. Okay, turn the page, please. Page 78. Here at the top, has the number one by it. This is the most common violation I find in the field. Almost everywhere I go, I find a violation of this. Develop a written training program. Every body shop that this rule applies to must have a training program. You must have an initial training where you train your painters on, on uh, what they're supposed to do, and then you're required to have an annual refresher by May 1st of every year. Okay, so let's talk about the training program, what it's supposed to be. It includes two parts. It includes a written procedure, which is sort of like what we're doing now, where someone would stand in front of you and, and talk to you and tell you about the rule itself. And it also requires a hands-on demonstration where you have to go out to the shop and manipulate the guns, uh, look at the gun cleaner, that sort of thing. So there's two parts to the training, the hands-on and the written. And you must have both to comply with Indiana's rule. Now, if you look there on the page 78 at the top, it lists four or five things there that uh, must be included in any training. Identification of coatings. Preparation of coatings and, and surface preparation products. Application of coatings. Operation and maintenance of spray gun cleaning equipment. Oper uh, work practice standards, we talked about those, some of the housekeeping procedures we talked about. And then procedures to gather, record, report data and so forth. So those are the minimum, the very minimum that you should cover in any training, any written training program. And then you go out and look at it. Okay, so you, those are the mer bare minimum items that you must cover in a training, the ones that we just talked about there. Okay? And remember, this is an annual training requirement. The federal rule, 6-H, requires training every five years. It has their initial training and then every five years. Indiana is more strict. We require annual refresher. And the reason for that is just to remind painters that you're supposed to be keeping the lids closed. You're supposed to be using the gun cleaner. You're supposed to be keeping track of your VOCs. So we require an annual refresher by May 1st of every year. And like I said, this is one of the most common violations I find in the field. Now let's talk about what you need to have to prove that you were trained. You, got, you must have some type of proof. You must have a document that, that kind of talks about what you went through. It needs to have a list of all the people who attended the date that it happened, and then who did the training, the signature of the trainer, you know, his or herself. So you need to have sort of an agenda of what you covered. You need to have the names of the people who attended. You need to have the signature of the training, of the trainer, and then the date. 
and you need to keep that on site on, in your shop. Because when I come to visit you or another inspector, we're going to ask to see that every time. Okay, down at the bottom, it talks about the manufacturer of coatings, the paint companies, basically. This is the information they must provide the body shop. Product description, date of manufacturer, thinning instructions, VOC content, who's purchasing the product, that sort of thing. That's the information they must give a body shop when they make a batch of coat or a distributor. And then right below that in B, kind of there in the middle of the page where it says any person who is engaged in commercially providing coatings, there's information there that they must give the body shop. So the body shop can keep track of, of what they've done. Indiana requires annual training, and it has to be specific to this rule. A lot of people down in the southern counties are going to 6-H training put on by their paint company, and they come back and they think that's sufficient. But I walk in and it's only for 6-H. That's not going to work for Indiana's rule, because our rule's different, as you guys have mentioned. Our rule is different, so you have to have training for our rule, and you have to have training for 6-H. Now, you can do it at the same time. You can go to a paint company and in the morning talk about 6-H, in the afternoon talk about 810, Indiana's rule. But you have to have training specific for Indiana's rule. And the feds require training specific for their rule. So you have to have both on hand. You have to be able to provide me a document that says that you're in compliance with 810, the state rule, as well as when the feds come in, they're going to want something that says 6-H. Okay? Everybody understand that? They're two totally different rules, so you got to be able to have training from both. Okay? Okay, I want everyone to look at this, page 79. Down here, where it says C. Okay? Everybody look at that. I want everyone's attention to look at that. What does it say? It says that any owner of a facility must submit to the department a statement signed by a responsible official, the owner, the operator, whoever the manager is, certifying that your facility has acquired and will continuously employ coatings or surface preparation products that meet the VOC limits. That must be submitted to our office. And right now we have just a little bit more than zero of those because people aren't aware of that requirement. You can just take this paragraph right here and put on there, I, John Doe of John Doe's Body Shop, uh, have acquired and will continuously employ coatings or surface preparation products meeting the VOC limits of your rule. That was fine with us. One of the things I want to ask when I go there is, have you submitted this? And if you haven't, then I will be asking you to submit it. But if you have a piece of paper, you can write that on there. Put your name, your title, and uh, the, date, the date that you sign it, and also your address for your facility. We need to have your facility's name, your name, your title, the address, and your signature. The date, of course. Now, real quick, before I forget, Take out this document here. It says frequently asked questions. Okay, take out this document, frequently asked questions. Turn to page five. Page five. Right in the middle of the page there is our address. That's where you send it when you get it done. You made it, you've written it out. You've made a copy for yourself. Send the original to that address. Okay? Middle of page five. That's why I put it in there so you could send it to us. All right, any questions on that statement? Remember, it's a one time thing. Once you do it, you're done with that. Just keep it on site. Okay, turn the page, page 80. Now we're going to talk about the record keeping. Middle of the page there, 8-10-9, page 80. For each batch of coating mixed or refinishing job performed, for each one, you must keep A through H there. So if you have a job, you assign an ID number to it, that's A. B, the date that you did it. C, the coating category. Remember that we had that back? We had the categories and we had the VLC limits. That, whatever category that is, top coat, pre-coat, whatever. You need to list that. You need to list whoever made the coating, whether it's DuPont or whoever. The quantity that you use, the VOC content that you use, the manufacturer's name and identification number, and the quantity of components added or the mix ratio that you use. Okay? 
That's the information you have to keep for every job that you do. That's the bare minimum of information that you have to keep. And that's where I'm going to spend the bulk of my time when I come to do an inspection in your facility, just looking at that and making sure you're keeping all that. Okay, look at number two, right below that H there. For each surface preparation product, then it's listed there, manufacturer's name, substrate, and VOC content. That, that will help us to understand what content, what, what category that is and what the VOC limit is listed in the rule. Then number three there, documents such as MSDS or some places use product data sheets. Whichever one of those you use, you need to keep it on site for the coatings and the solvents that you have on site. So the MSDS or product data sheet, whichever one you use, keep that on site for three years. Three years. Now, if your paint company comes to you and says, hey, we got this great new paint, we want you to try it. You try it and say, this is the worst paint I've ever had. I'm not going to use this again. You need to keep that MSDS for three years from that point forward. And then you can get rid of it after that. But you need to keep it on site for three years. Okay? Okay, you look down here at the bottom at B down here. Other records you need to keep. You need to keep records of your training program. We talked about that name of the trainer, the date you were trained, who attended, and an agenda of your training. Okay, you need to keep that on site. And then two is that compliance statement we just talked about that I said everyone has to submit just one time. This is where it's required for you to be kept, keep it on your shop, in your shop, on the premises. So that statement, you need to send the original to me and keep a copy for yourself on site. Okay. Then there it says that you must keep a record of all all of your records must be kept for a minimum of three years. And then it says that if I show up or EPA shows up, you have to show them the records. Then turn to page 81. Here's the last thing. If you're operating your business, paint company sends you a can of paint that's 300 VOC. It's just way out there. It's just crazy high. Or if it's above any of the limits in the rule, you notice it before you use it. You need to contact us and tell us that you did that, that it was sent to you and, that you, and what you did to correct that. For instance, you get this very high VOC paint, and you look at it and say, whoa, that's way too high. And then you call the paint company and send it back to them. You need to send us a notice at IDEM, let us at that same address, tell us that you received it, and say, I just sent it back to them. Or if you use it, just say, we received three gallons of paint, use 2.7 gallons, and realized it was too high, send it back to the paint company. Okay. So the rule requires that you do that. Okay. That's it for the rule. But one thing I want to I stress to you before you leave. When I go into a body shop, one of the things that keeps me there longer than anything is if you're disorganized. If you organize your shop and keep everything together in one area, I'll get out of your hair probably in an hour or less. Roughly, you know, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. But if I go in there and I say, okay, I want to see this, you say, oh, that's in this room. Then we have to go to this room. And then I say, okay, I need to see this. Oh, that's two doors, two rooms down. Then we go down here and look at this. Then we go over there. Then we go over there. I'm going to be there most of the day looking at your records. So the more organized you are, the faster you'll get me in and out of your shop. And you won't have to deal with it as long. So I strongly encourage you, keep everything together in one area if you can. Organize yourself so that everything's right there together. I walk in, you say, here is everything you need to see. I look at it, I go out, look at your shop, and then I get out. And then we're done. So organize yourselves as good as you can. If you would, look at that comparison sheet again. Up here at the top, I want to focus you. For Indiana's rule, my name is Vaughn Eisen, that's me, that's my phone number. If you have questions about 6H, the federal rule, Mark Stoddard's the guy, and that's his phone number, right below mine. If you call me and ask me about 6-H, I'm going to say call Mark because I don't know. If you call Mark about Indiana's rule, he's probably going to say talk to Ron. Okay, so call me about Indiana's rule. Call Mark about the state, the federal rule.